Thank you very much, controversies. I mean, the long-term plan, deliberative <coughs> engagement. I can see some <coughs> nattily dressed people here waiting to invade our place. Betty and Kenneth. And Wendy Phillip, is she there too? Yes. <coughs> Rightio, guys. We've had a bit of a chew over this the other day. This is going to be an entertaining thing, but not too entertaining, not too long, I hope. Sorry, Julie, are you up to the next one? No, 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 it's fine. Righto. Welcome. Let's have the concise version, please. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Kia ora koutou. Uh, thank you for having us. We're here to <coughs> recommend to the governing body a uh, suite of deliberate democracy approaches that we would like to incorporate as part of our engagement plan for the long-term plan consultation. Um, <clears throat> before I go further, I just want to introduce again Wendy Phillip, who will talk to the substantive aspects of the different approaches, uh, which you'll see on the slides, and which were part of the appendix that was um, attached to the report, as well as Taito Edi Toyevi, who also um, comments on any questions that you might have in terms of best practice re in relation to deliberate democracy approaches. Um, before I hand it over to Wendy, just to provide more context, so uh, in the direction to council group from the mayor and the council, uh, councillor's document, um, a lot of you asked for different ways and more options in terms of how we engage and consult communities for the long-term plan, which we've gone away and obviously thought about. But this is also taking into account changes in terms of democracy across the globe, which Eddie can talk to in a bit more detail. It's important for us to ensure that we are um, supporting democracy in Tamaki Makoto in a way that allows us to try different ways to encourage people to participate. Um, and while um, you will have seen in previous annual budgets an increase in the quantity of submissions that we are seeing from uh, the people across Auckland, we also wanted to improve the quality of that feedback. And part of that is allowing them to come closer to the issues, to better understand the consequences and the financial implications of the decisions that need to be made so that they can also um, have a better grasp of the trade-offs and the priorities that you will be faced with, with uh, making in terms of the decisions that you will make. At this point, um, I'll pass it over to Wendy Phillip to talk through what those deliberative democracy approaches that we would like to include as part of our general engagement approach for the long-term plan. Thank you, Ken. Uh, kia ora, everyone. Um, just um, I'll take you through uh, six options that we, um, we put forward. Um, and I just want to say that this is a, a supplement to the, the comms and engagement plan that will, um, um, which will be coming out a, a little bit later. So the reason that this is in advance is because there's a significant amount of planning that's required. So um, we've got six options. So um, I've got two options on each slide. So the first uh, two options are participatory budgeting tools. One is a, a digital tool. Um, some of you might remember we had um, something similar a few years ago, Balancing Act. And the other one is a, uh, the equivalent but a physical tool for use at events. So they're both going to be, um, or the plan is to use them both uh, during the consultation period. Uh, and they're interactive tools that will allow Aucklanders to trade off um, between what they consider to be the, the priorities. And it's going to cover all um, the LTP topics um, with uh, significant financial implications. So the benefits of this are, are that they, uh, it will educate people, it will allow people to understand the, the need for a trade off, and it encourages people to feedback as well. Um, so I think Ken just wanted to talk about one um, element, yeah. one risk. So just to bring to your attention, obviously an online digital tool provides us, or applies Aucklanders with better access uh, through online channels to the budget information. But uh, with the digital online tool, there is a risk around ensuring that the financial data that we're providing to the public to consider different scenarios is as accurate as possible. And that obviously needs to go through an auditing process and our financial team 
I obviously need to be involved in that. Given that there are time pressures and resource pressures that are involved in that, I thought I'd bring that caveat to your attention because that will eventually determine uh, before February whether we can go ahead with that tool, uh, but also whether the level of information that we can provide them is enough for the public to actually get their heads around some of the detail that they need to, to be able to make those trade-off type uh, considerations. Because um, ultimately, you know, if we can only give them generic information, then the feedback that you will get from that won't be as helpful or as meaningful as it could be if we could get that more detailed information uh, in time. So we're just putting that caveat in place as we look through that tool, although we see the tool as quite a useful uh, channel to, pro to provide an interactive experience to collect information. We just need to be, give you that caveat that we are at this point um, seeing that there could be a risk in terms of the, the accuracy of the data that we can provide uh, for people to consider when they're using that tool. Thank you, Ken. Moving on to uh, option C and D, which are the participatory forums. Um, I might start with, with participatory forum, the second one, which is the community leaders and advisory panel members, um, because this is what we did for the annual budget. Uh, you might remember that um, uh, they, we had a series of workshops. Um, uh, they were given the information, they deliberated over it, and, and uh, there was a report that was provided to you as part of the annual budget um, feedback. Um, so what these are, they're a series of three workshops. Uh, they're on the LTP topics, again. Um, and it allows the, the, uh, the participants to really understand uh, the subject, the challenges, the trade-offs, and they become more informed um, and, and in turn can give more informed feedback. Um, it also increases the, the trust that, we, that they, um, they have in Auckland Council as well because they are, they are really uh, participating and feel, feel really valued. Um, so the, the first one is with the general public. Um, this is um, a participatory forum that we're proposing in uh, as a substitute for a citizens assembly, which um, I'll take I'll take you through shortly. Um, uh, but that that one is um, we're suggesting is going to be postponed. <coughs> the timing for this is that it needs to start. Um, we need to start planning and recruiting for this as soon as possible, um, and hence the the need for getting your approval as soon as possible. Um, yeah. So. If I can just add to that, so. The, the participatory forum, one of you, some of you may be asking the question, well, how do we select the people to participate in a participatory forum from the general population? So that is uh, quite a comprehensive process that we follow to ensure that the criteria will allow a more representative cohort of Aucklanders to be involved. So we would be looking at things like age, gender, uh, ethnicity, um, household, makeup, etc., so that we have that cross-section of Aucklanders participating in, that, in, in those forums at the time. Um, which is part of the reason why the planning uh, needs to happen uh, this side of Christmas as much as possible so we can execute uh, in time for February, March, which is the consultation period. Thank you, Ken. Option E is an Auckland, an Auckland Conversations. Um, this is um, a, a conversation with, they have panel members with uh, key, um, key speakers. Uh, it, it allows um, robust conversations, different views, people explaining things, um, encouraging participation. Uh, and the aim for that is to, to include um, as many people as possible. Uh, and it's, it's part of the, the process of taking the public on the journey um, with us through this deliberative democracy. The, uh, the option F is the Citizens' Assembly, which I mentioned before. Uh, this is a bigger, more robust process. Again, a series of weekend workshops. Um, from the workshop on September the 13th, the suggestions that we received were climate-focused. Um, it's, it's, it's like the participatory forum with the general public, but a bigger, uh, longer process. There will be approximately 40 to 50 people it's similar to the one that um, the water care did. And um, the benefit, again, it builds trust, it encourages engagement and that shared responsibility in decision making. Uh, the biggest risk with this one, uh, and hence we're recommending it, it, it be postponed, is the time to prepare and recruit for that. 
Um, and then obviously the, the, um, the need for the agreement on the topic for deliberation, because this is just one topic rather than a multiple topics. And that is all of them. Happy to take questions. Okay, well, I'll start off. Um, are we supposed to be making a decision on this right now? That is correct, Mayor Brown. Okay. We're, we're asking you to uh, approve the recommendations for the five different approaches to add to the engagement plan for February, March next year for the long-term plan. These All being right. deliberate well, democracy approaches. I'll look at the three, three, three-hour sessions. Right, that's nine hours of work for sixty grand. That's six thousand dollars an hour. Sounds like a good, good party. I'll come along. What are you putting on? Champagne. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, it just seems to me a pretty high expense for nine hours of work. You know, call me old-fashioned, but um, God knows what it costs to have a long, boring day like here. And a, few crappy sandwiches for lunch so uh, I just I don't know how you get those figures is it is how much does the facilitator get can I do can I be a facilitator of that sort of money should I reckon I can do a good job of it <laughs> hey I bet I get a crowd and I'd certainly make sure they understood the financial implications of everything they put their hand up for as well so I'm not trying to be overly negative here, but I, I just want to know that these are good value. And, I, and the whole point, of, I mean, it can be good value. I quite, the one I liked was the digital balancing tool because it helps people show the trade-offs we have to make. Because I don't want to have $6,000 an hour and find that all they wanted was a whole lot of things that you don't have a budget for. And we've had a lot of uh, workshops so far amongst my fellow councillors, and I haven't heard a lot of things we're not going to do. I've heard a lot of things we are going to do, but I'm kind of worried that we're getting to the end of this and there will be the mayor's job to list all the things we're not going to do. But some, we need, to, if it's going to work, it's got to have some robust ability to get the public to say what they won't have. Otherwise, it's just, there's another 60 grand that we won't have. All right? Thank you, Mr Mayor. So the participatory forums and the people that we invite to be part of the, that uh, uh, conversation will be tasked as part of the facilitation process to understand what's at stake for Auckland, but also to have a robust opinion in terms of the trade-offs that need to be made. Obviously, as you say, the decision finally will be yours and the governing body, but uh, what we're trying to do is bring the issues closer to the public so they understand them fully and can appreciate right, the pros and cons of the consequences that will, will obviously, obviously in, be incurred as a result of the decisions that are made. It's going to be tough either way, but the trade-offs need to happen. There is expertise that's required to run these types of sessions, and there's also a commitment from the public to attend these sessions. These are part of the significant costs that you mentioned, um, the biggest contributions to the costs that you mentioned uh, earlier. But um, if we want to have a quality process that we follow that is aligned to best practice globally, we need to do it this way so that we can stand by and have confidence in the quality of the feedback that we get as a result. But I'll ask my colleagues also if they'd like to comment. I mean, what, we've got so many underutilised facilities around here, surely we don't have to hire facilities. Is that...? Yeah, we can, uh, wherever we can, we will um, use the council facilities, uh, and wherever we can, we use internal resources. For example, uh, we'll, we'll be briefing the, um, the uh, people we want to do, the independent uh, recruiters to recruit the people, for example. Uh, but there's an element of independence that's required to, to make sure that the people participating trust us. I'm pretty sure they'd trust Eddie to be the facilitator. I mean, I don't trust PwC, and we seem to recruit them all the bloody time. So um, uh, please try and do this cheaply. Look like we're trying to save money. Councillor Walker. So just following on from the mayor, um, one of the things we did um, was during, maybe it was during COVID or the like, is we had some webinars. And you can get a lot of people um, hooking into something like that. I just put the question, why don't we do that sort of thing? Because there's a mass market out there that lots of people can get to. So that's, so that's one question I've got. And sometimes, you know, that 
doesn't involve a lot of expense. The other question I've got is just a concern I'd raise around trade-offs, and I understand that there's only so much money, but in order to effectively discuss that, you've got to have considerations around scenarios so that people have actually got choices, and we're not very good at that. So I just want to put that out there. The other suggestion I'd make is we've got a lot of information, and I raised this earlier, that we're pulling together for the budget that we see in workshops. It's got lots of nice graphics and pictures and all kinds of stuff. We should be utilising the material that we're already generating that's actually costing quite a bit of money internally to pump some stuff out there that's easy for people to understand. And then the last question I've got just goes to anything to do with climate. Unless we're actually pinning down what the emission savings are, and we're quantifying stuff, and we're identifying how quickly we're going to be able to do this and how economical it is, I have a real question as to whether stuff is worth it or not. And the reason for that is we're on a cliff in terms of our trajectory now to meet our climate cl change obligations, which are 50% reduction by 2030. So we need to shift from all this strategizing and dealing with real world stuff What's it going to do? How many emissions is it going to cut? How quickly can we do it? What money does it cost us? Because that's the mindset we should be at, and we're still not there. Otherwise, it's just piffle as far as I'm concerned, and we don't achieve anything, and our emission trajectory continues to go up. So that's my concern around anything to do with climate. Thanks. Good on you. I don't know if you've just accepted those questions. I don't have an answer, but Councillor Fooley, not here. Councillor Deputy Mayor Simpson. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. Look, thanks, Wendy um, and crew. Uh, I want to say congratulations because one of the um, things that you didn't mention is I noticed that um, tools such as what you're suggesting were um, put up by Peter Gluckman's um, report, which is, of course, a COI2 report. So thank you for that. Look, I've just got a couple of questions. Um, I'm leaning towards the online participating... Participating... A. Uh, uh, because I think, you know, um, Councillor Williamson's used it before. Uh, you know, I think it's an easier tool. But what I'm really keen to know is that can it be done so it shows a 10-year view? Because quite often, you know, just because you make a decision one year, that's not the answer. It's on annual plans of 10 years. So actually to show it over 10 years, um, is that possible? I mean, if you're doing an LTP, you'd want it to be a 10-year um, impact. Uh, I, I think that's actually a question for um, Ross and team. Okay. Uh, because they put the, they give us the data to put it into, into that. Okay, so for me, I think that's a, that's a key part, you know. If you're going to have it, make sure it's relevant to the 10 years, because that's what you're signing in for. Um, look, and my second question is, uh, um, your report has a section, uh, Role of Decision Makers in Deliberative Process. Can you expand on what the experience overseas has been, not so much during the processes, but how have the decision makers typically used the results of these processes? You know, for, you know does it take, does it in any way take um, away or reduce the democratic role of elected members? Because I think that's quite important. Thanks for the uh, part IDM. It goes to the heart of one of the most common misconceptions of deliberative democracy, which is it takes away from the democratic right of elected members to govern and make decisions. Um, as a deliberative practitioner of more than a decade, um, that's absolute nonsense. What it does do and in our experience, and if you look at the data from places like the Netherlands, Canada, if you look across the digit, Australia, what it does is it enhances the decision making because if you were to back the truck up perhaps one step, the part that we probably do need to ask is why deliberative democracy in the first place? And I think it goes right back to the question of what does the uh, environment look like in terms of trust in central and local government? We all know the figures. We look at the turnout rates, we look at engagement. This is just one mechanism um, that readily adapts or responds to complex intergenerational issues that we're facing um, that we obviously don't have the answers to. The experience, and I'm happy to uh, provide that through the chair, um, is that once you get over the misconception of what it is and what it isn't, 
you actually find that in circumstances where you have to do more with less, it's more of a mandate. You cut through the loud noise of, you know, the simulation is terrific, and I'll give you that, and I thank you for the support. However, it is quite superficial, it is quite high level. If you embark on a deliberative process, people not only have to walk your shoes, but they have to go through these trade-offs, such as the dialogue that is had at this table. So does it replace selected members? It does not. It enhances and enriches and is designed to help you make more quality uh, decision-making. If I could just add also to Toto Eddie's comments, for the purposes of the long-term plan, the, the intention is for us to run these deliberative democracy approaches and the feedback that we provide you will be considered alongside the consultation feedback, not instead of or not in, uh, not um, being considered more value to you. It's the same weighting to be given to all. Uh, Ken, I think that's really a key, so thanks for that. Yeah, thanks, team. Thank you. Very good answer. Thank you, Eddie. You should have spoken first. That would have stopped all these bloody questions. Mike Lee. Thank you very much. I see a whole variety of uh, events and fora uh, relating to the long-term plan, but I don't see what was agreed to in principle at our annual plan meeting in February this year, that there would be hearings so that the members of the public can come before their elected representatives, as they did in regard to the Maori seats issue, and we can sit here what they have to say directly. What I'm concerned about here is something that looks like very much a contrived, top-down um, manufacturing consent effort. I think when in, there's a citizens' assembly on climate change and so on. What we have to... We're talking about a possibly a $100 billion 10-year plan here. This is major for Auckland. Um, I, I think we, we, in regard to democracy, we have to walk the talk. I think, if I recall, in February this year when we discussed the annual plan, it was an emergency council meeting, if I recall, um, post the weather events. Councillor Bartley um, raised concerns that there should be a formal hearing for the annual plan, and I supported that and others did as well. She was talked out of that. I think she went as far as moving um, a, a, a motion to that end. She was talked out of that um, by assurances that we can look at this during the long-term plan, and I think we need to uphold that, that promise. It wasn't particularly signed off or anything, but it was the reason why she backed off that was an assurance that when it came to the long-term plan, we would have hearings, as this council used to have, which is a fundamental uh, aspect of democracy in local government. Well, we're going to have to have a formal thing now because we've run out of time and I've got to have an extension of time. So can someone move? Uh, hey? Just we need to be aware of, if we don't heed the public voice, we just need, need to be aware of possible citizens assembly, assemblies where people come armed with yeah. pitchforks. That can happen if people get too arrogant. Yeah. Very yeah, good. Okay. To quickly answer. Do I have a seconder for extension okay. of time? Yeah. Okay. All those in favour, I say aye. aye. To the contrary, aye. me. Unfortunately, I lost that, and so we have an extension of time. And questions should be questions rather than speeches, if that's possible. I've got two more speeches, speech questions, one from Watson, one from Ferry, and then we're going to decide what we're going to do with this stuff. It's not a hell of a lot of money, I mean, and it may be useful. OK. Watson, please. OK, I'll just wait for you to finish your speech, uh, Mr Mayor. Um, just quickly, and I, I certainly endorse your um, your sentiment about frugality and being very aware of costs. I think that's a really good point. My simple question is, the uh, VKT deliberative uh, democracy um, event will be getting reported back at some point soon. So I'm very interested to see how that works out in practice. Mr Mayor, that was a far bigger scale. One of your events is, I think, 35 people. It was 100. 
with all the representative uh, nature of, of Auckland as a whole. So I'm, I'd like to see what comes out of that, because for me that will certainly be a gauge as to the you know, effectiveness of, of, of this process. So, um, and so I think there's people in the transport team that should be able to let us know what's going on there. Thanks. VKT. Oh, yeah. Really? Is that an AT thing, is it? Oh. So, all right, what was the result? How many how many miles did you do doing that? So, Mr. Mayor, just in answer to Councillor Watson's uh, comments, obviously we'll be um, working closely with our Auckland Transport colleagues to ensure that we take the learnings from that and adapt them to our opportunity to use the democracy as part of the long-term plan going forward. And webinars, just to answer uh, Councillor Walker's comments, webinars will be obviously part of our engagement approach. We're not here to talk about the broader engagement approach, just about how we want to incorporate the democracy into the engagement approach. We will come back to you with our engagement approach early in the new year, which will also consider the idea of hearings. Well done, thank you. Councillor Ferry, then no, I'm gonna put the damn thing. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll just note that the, the, the report on this is really clear that we're only talking about these additional deliberative democracy options. So, you know, it's really clear that we are going to do the webinars, we are going to look at the hearings, all of that. So I'm a bit confused about why we're relitigating that. Um, my question, though, to the staff is um, the role that these kinds of tools, and I'm keen to support more, um, the role that these kinds of tools play in terms of building trust and engagement longer term so thinking beyond just the input for these specific processes, what's your view on, on the role of these tools with that kind of work? Uh, through the Chair. Uh, Councillor, the uh, response to that is yes, yes, and absolutely yes. I think if we look at the existing conventional styles of engagement that we currently do and undertake and deliver, they're necessary, they're consultative, they're statutory, um, but they're not enough. Um, and so if we embark on this kind of a journey, there is a huge opportunity to really take every Aucklander with us through uh, non-conventional and engagement terms. So yes, yes, and yes. My additional comment will just be for democracy to thrive and evolve, it needs citizens to take a bigger role than they currently are in the decision-making process. And that needs, we just need to make space for that to happen in a way that fits with the representative democracy model that we currently have. Kia ora, and thank you for the work with the advisory panels earlier around um, doing one of those D, option Ds, that was fantastic. Councillor Newman, quick one, no? I propose that we uh, put this, I'll move this, and it's been seconded by Councillor Darby, all those in favour please say aye. aye. To the contrary, carried, well done, thanks, we've gone to extra time, and we're now going on to item 